Hi, I'm Galina, and today we have the amazing Claudette Roche with us. Claudette is an award-winning accent and dialect coach. She was named one of the top five voice coaches in Hollywood. So you would think that Claudette is only available to celebrities and top executives. Uh, well, actually, Claudette has created mobile apps that help speakers of other languages reduce their accents while speaking American English. Her app for Chinese speakers has been downloaded more than 100,000 times in China. So in this interview, Claudette and I talk about her background and how she became an accent coach. Enjoy the interview and I will see you in the comments below. So, the questions. Okay. So what do you do and who are your clients? Okay, so what I do, I'm a dialect coach, or as I like to call myself, an accent coach, and my clients are everyone. I teach different accents to different people, so I teach foreign accents to American actors, I teach the American accent to foreign actors. I teach the American accent to real people, not actors, and I teach American actors to Americans. Huh. Wow, that's a lot. That means, so if they, let's say they're from California and they want to sound like they're from New York, so they're still American, but it's regional, so now I have to teach them to their ear, it's a completely foreign accent. They've heard it, but they've never done it. So I teach everything, so I teach Foreigners to sound American, Americans how to sound foreign, blah, 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 everything. <laughs> so, cool. How did you get started as an accent coach? Oh, well, interesting question because, number one, I was born in England and so I had an English accent growing up and then I moved to my family and I uh, moved to Montreal and I didn't want to go. I loved England. I loved my home. Um, but we lived in Montreal for a long time. So I had to keep amending my accent. So when I left England, I used to talk like this, right? So like this. And then I moved to Montreal and I had to change it, didn't I? Yeah, I did. So I had to change it and I start to talk like this a little bit, you know, which is not, it's not really French Canadian, but to some people this sounds really French, but it's not. It's like Anglo um, Montreal accent. And then I also had to learn um, to speak French. So I learned to speak French there or there, and then I moved to Toronto, or Toronto, as people from there like to call their city, and I lived there for about six years, and I had to change my accent again. Then I moved to LA, and that wasn't so much of a transition because I had prepared for my move. I knew I, knew I was gonna move to LA, I think when I was five. I had always wanted to live here, so I had always sort of geared my accent more to an American sound. So when I lived in Toronto is when I really, really pushed that envelope to sound really American, so I really focused on what Americans do. So when I moved here, and also let me just backtrack, I was an actress, so I was using my accents in my work. and. I think I'm just lucky in that I have a I have a good ear. So I hear accents, I know what people are changing. So and sometimes subconsciously, I'm not even thinking about what they're doing. I just imitate the sound and the music. So I while I was as while I was an actress, I was still teaching um, my friends. Uh, certain friends needed certain accents, and so I would teach them. But it wasn't my profession. My profession was acting. But I've been teaching accents all along. Then, then, um, yeah, then, um, a number of years ago, I came to sort of a, um, um, like a little crossroads in my career as an actress, and I really wasn't, I wasn't enjoying the process at all, and so I didn't know what else I could do, and I had forgotten about the accent coaching, and all I knew was I needed something else, so I did this thing that I'd like to share with your, with your, um, your what? Audience. Your, your audience. <laughs> what do you call them? Your audience. And so I didn't know what to do. So I decided to ask five friends. And these were friends that some I'd known for a long time and some I didn't. And I took each one out, out for lunch separately. And my question to them was, 
what am I good at? That's all. Just what am I good at? So the first person said that I was a good cook. And I said, true, I am amazing. <laughs> and what can I do with that? And she said, you could have your own restaurant or a catering business. And I said, no, thanks, not for me. Next friend said that I was a good writer, writer with a T, and um, that I should write screenplays or work for television or something. And it's not that easy to do. Um, so that was really not in the cards for me. And then um, the third person said that I was very funny and that I should do stand-up comedy. Okay. Not- <laughs> okay. Talk about a hard life. That's really, really hard. If I thought being an actress was hard, being a stand-up comic is harder. Not happening. The four- Am I up to four? Fourth friend said, well, I was a belly dancer. Um, part-time. I started out just for fun, and I started... Um, performing about three months after I'd started taking belly dance classes and I was actually doing parties and weddings and things and just loving it and I had this long wig it was very great and so she said become a professional belly dancer Mm -hmm. if I was 20 maybe that would be good but I'm only 25 so (laughs) why are you laughing I could be 25 (laughs) anyway I was at the age where that wasn't going to be a good idea the fifth friend, who didn't know me all that well, she, she was the one I knew the least. And she said, you're really good at accents. I said, yes, I am. What can I do with that? And she said, teach as a profession. And I thought, oh, my God, I never thought about actually teaching and actually making money from teaching. I sure do love it, and I think I'm really good at it. Okay. Okay. So I started teaching. So I decided on a Tuesday that I was going to become a dialect accent coach. Thursday, I had my first student, and I've never looked back. And that's it. So I just started with diving into what I love. And, what, so, and, and also, I was open to anything. If, she, if, if a friend had said, you're very good at doing um, gymnastics, I would have become a gymnastics teacher. Or if I'm good at holding yellow paper, then I would somehow find a career holding yellow paper and being the best at holding yellow paper. So I was open to anything at all, anything. So I'd like to pass this on to your your audience, especially like women, for us to rely on each other. Yes. You know, and quite frankly, my first student was a woman. I mean, it doesn't really matter, but my first student was a woman. She was recommended to me through another woman who, she was a teacher and she just didn't do what I did. So it was my, a woman helping me, my telling a woman I'm now hanging out my shingle, as we say, hanging out my shingle as a dialect coach. So it was woman helping woman helping woman. And then I needed a mentor because I'd never had a business. Who was it? A woman. And women have just been, you know, really, it's a wonderful sisterhood. It really can be a wonderful sisterhood. And we understand each other's issues and our dilemmas and our desires and how excited. I'm talking a lot, aren't I? (laughs) No, please keep talking. I love it. Um, I just think it's, it's exciting because you don't have to drag things out of women. Women are just, you ask one a question. Oh, my God. So you sit back and just let her talk like I'm doing. Yes, I'm I'm loving it. I just like, uh, I don't want, I don't want her to stop. (laughs) <laughs> but it's great like even like what you're doing I love what you're doing I just think it's so powerful and we really I really believe that we as women can make really great changes I think small so changes too. you know little by little but together we can do so much I agree with that absolutely absolutely. so when you started as an accent coach was it like a job like a real job or did people do that? Um, as do, in, other, do other people do this? Yes. Oh, was yeah. It, was it like a well-known job? Yeah, it was. Unbeknownst to me, I didn't realize how many people there were. Right. Um, yeah, dialect coaching is, it's not a big industry. And there aren't, there aren't a lot of people doing it. Um, but there are, oops, I just someone, seen someone loves me, someone texted. She's <laughs> from, this girl is from Uzbekistan. Wow. That's, that's near Russia. 
Yes, and so she needs a lesson tomorrow. Yeah, there, there, there are certainly quite a few accent coaches in LA, particularly here because we have a lot of actors who, um, who need to transform their sounds. Um, but there are accent coaches all over the country, all over the world. Because if you went to China and you learned Mandarin, Cantonese, whichever, and maybe you want to sound really authentic, you would then go to a to an accent coach so that your your Mandarin sounds like you were born in China, mm-hmm. and it's possible. So there, every country has its own dialect coaches. I had no idea about that. I know. Yeah, I, you see, this is it. You see, a lot of people, um, a lot of, let's say, um, non-Americans come here, and they are in business, they're actors, or they're, they're reg- real people. <laughs> real people. <laughs> but, you know, real people. Um, you know, I have a lot of dentists and lawyers and businessmen. Electri- I have everybody. And so they come here, and they find that, by not having a great command of the accent, their English might be perfectly flawless, perhaps even better than the average American. But their accent prevents them from being understood, and so they are stuck because they don't know that there's a possibility that they can change, alter, amend, twist their accent so people stop saying, huh? What'd you say? What? I don't understand you. What? (laughs) Or just walk away which happens. So it's, um, I, I really want people to know that this is something that they can alter. Maybe they won't sound 100% American, maybe that's not even important to them, but it's all about communication. And if, if, if your grammar and your vocabulary is beautiful, but the other person, the American, can't understand you, well then what was the point? And people lose work because they're not understood. They lose clients, they lose opportunities. They lose relationships. Can I share a story? Yes, please. Yes. Please. So I had um, a friend. I have a friend of mine. She's an American. She was born here, and she was telling me about this Russian woman actually that she met, and she said this Russian woman is just fabulous. She's great. Oh, I just oh, I just think she's fabulous. But she has this really strong Russian accent, and so I said so, and she said well. I have a really hard time understanding her, and I'm not sure that she understands me 100%. So I'm not going to pursue the friendship. Wow. Because it's, because it's too much work. So she thinks most of her time will be spent, excuse me, um, speaking like this so that the woman can understand her. And then also she then, the Russian woman is speaking to her, and she's only getting... 10% or whatever percentage of what the Russian woman is saying. So now everyone's tense. They're both not understanding. So she just walked away from the relationship. Isn't that a shame? This is incredible. Yeah. So I know that you help people by create, you created an app for I, um, different speakers, right? I did. I did. Well, I just found that um, working one on one, you know, either the person comes to my office or we work on Skype is great. But there are certainly so many more people that I'm not able to reach. So um, I was going to do DVDs. But then someone said, that is old school. No one does DVDs anymore or CDs or any of those E's. And so I thought, well, then I guess there's no other option. I just don't do anything. And then my website designer said, let's make an app. And I didn't know what an app was when we started this whole process. And he said, I said, well, how are people going to learn an accent over the phone? I don't understand any of it. And so he said, just go write the script and I'll put it together and I'll make it happen. So I thought, well, let's address, at least let me not do, I didn't want to do a generic American accent because you wanting to sound American and someone from China wanting to sound American, but your issues are different from someone from China. Someone from China, it's different from someone in Korea learning to sound American. So I can't tell you as a Russian to do what I do for the Chinese because it's different. So I decided to make an app for uh, Chinese speakers. And then I actually have one for Korean speakers and Japanese speakers and Spanish speakers. And I've got a number of others waiting. Russian! 
Russia. And I've got one for Russian coming, India, Pakistan, or Pakistan, as they say in America, Pakistan. And um, we're going to create one for Iran, or as some Americans say, Iran. 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 Oh, sorry, Iran. Sometimes they think they're saying a foreign word with the proper accent. For example, Spanish words used very commonly here. So we have a word. I'm going to write it. Cool. That's my dog. That's his American accent. <laughs> Is he, does he also teach other dogs uh, the American accent? I make him work. So this is the word. Salsa. Right. That's how it should be said. But most Americans don't say salsa. They say salsa. Salsa. Not even. Sa. Salsa. Salsa. And then they put the salsa on their tacos. Okay. Yeah. Um, they uh, eat, they have balsamic, balsamic vinegar on their salad. And in their mind, it sounds foreign and perfect. They don't understand that salsa, taco, and balsamic is strange. Yeah, because in Spain, that's uh, or in in Latin America, salsa, taco, and balsamic, or balsamico, if you're Italian. So, uh, Claudette, I thought maybe could you give us um, some tips for um, you know Chinese speakers, oh sure, uh, Spanish speakers because there are a lot of them, and Russian because I'm Russian. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay. That was my computer telling me it's seven o'clock. Um, okay, so Chinese speakers. Um, I made a note here. Okay, so one of the things that, that it's not just Chinese people that do this, but a lot of people, but we're speaking about Chinese, so I'm going to keep it there. So I'm just going to use my little whiteboard. Wow. Wow. You so have fancy. a lot of equipment here. <laughs> a whiteboard is a lot of equipment. Okay, so there's this sound. There are two sounds. So we have this word. Apple. Right. Now, there are two things that, that Chinese people tend to do with this. Number one, they'll take this, a, ah, and make it more, e. Eh. The final L sound here, they don't use. They cheat it. Mm -hmm. So instead of apple, they say apple. Okay. And all I did was pull. My tongue never made an L. So it's quite typical for Chinese people to say people instead of people. Final becomes final. All becomes all. Ball becomes ball. So they're not quite making the L. So that's a very strong sound. Does that and make sense? Yes, and is it the work of Tong that kind of finishes this? Right. So the thing is that final L sound, um, it's not just Chinese people that do it. It's, and actually some English speakers do it. Some people from the southern United States do that. Okay. Same thing, exactly. And actually where I'm from in England, a lot of people where I'm from don't use the final L. So the word final where I'm from originally, would have been to some final. Again, I'm not going to use the L. That's very, that's, a, you know, I'm from the east end of London. So final, instead of final. So it's quite common. So it's, again, it's not just Chinese people. And then the, this sound of a, ah, Chinese people, if this is the word pat, so um, most Chinese people won't say, right, pat, they'll say pet which is, again, a whole other word, and now I don't understand you. Pat becomes pet. So I don't pat you on the head, I pet you on the head, pet. So that's a very common thing for Chinese people to do. Um, the final L, not using it properly, not using L strongly enough, always, and then um, the A becoming E. Uh, which again can change the word because if you're trying to say that you're you're very bad, you're bad, and 
if I don't use it, I've just said, your bed, your bed. And I'm going to think, I'm a bed. I'm going to, I'm a bed. So that's where the miscommunication happens. So even slight change of vowels uh, can yeah. lead to miscommunication. Wow. Especially if there's a word like it, like that. Mm -hmm. You know, if you say something like, you, let's say you, you, you said apple. Well, I'm going to think, okay, apple, apple. She must mean apple because there is no other. We don't have an apple. There's no such word in English. So I'll figure it out. But the problem is when there is a word similar. So if I wanted to say, my dad is here, my dad, and I used the wrong sound, I now say, my dad is here. My dad. Well, that's not good. So it's like the death or something? Correct. That's what I'll hear. Oh, okay. Which is, well, okay, I understand. But, I mean, don't people try to um, kind of understand the context of what um, the other person is saying? If they take the time. If they take the time. But if they don't have the time and you're in a store and you need to communicate, communicate, communicate. Yes, communicate and you need to communicate quickly, they're not going to take the time. Or they just really don't understand. And you might say, and that, that Chinese person might say it over and over and over again, but for some reason, they're just not understanding. Sometimes it really is not their fault. They really hear something else. Um, again, it, it's really, some, some things are taken out of context, and so you can't really fault the, uh, the person listening. Yeah, so the apps are to get to as many people as I can. Yeah, my that's goal great. is yeah, my goal with the app is um, which is called I can see ya. I can see ya. And so I can see ya is my goal is to have everyone have the app, of course, but I'm it would actually make everyone sound the same so each person can can understand each other. So that eventually someone from China can have the app and speak to someone from Russia when we have it out. So the Russian and the Chinese person can speak English, because that'll be the common language, the same way, and they'll understand each other. We, we, we need a, a Russian app to understand Chinese speaking I English. Know, you know. I know, I know. Soon. I mean, I keep saying that, but soon. It's, you know, the, the process of making apps is annoying. <laughs> Those of you who have my app, understand the work that I've gone through for you. It's really hard. Um, but it, it looks so good. And, uh, thank you. So ye yesterday I was going through the Spanish app again for because oh, there is right. no Russian app for so far. So yes, I heard you. I heard you. <laughs> wow, you're annoying. <laughs> so um, I was wondering maybe if you... Uh, maybe could you uh, give some examples for some tips for Ru for Russian speaking? Um, okay, what you just audience. said. Tips. Tips. Okay. Tips. 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 So Russian. Um, what can I give you? Um, Russian. It's not so much you because your accent isn't. Um, your accent is quite lovely. So yeah, it's lovely. Russians can um, say for instead of. Think. 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 Mm -hmm. Instead of... Um, Russians love voiced consonants like L and M and D and N. They love them. So, for example, instead of American baby, Russians. Baby. Is baby. And everything, the, when Russians speak, it's so much in the throat. It's so relaxing. It's my favorite accent to teach. I don't know why. I taught it on Sunday to an African-American to sound Russian. And so I, um, the Russian speaks from the back of the throat. Is, is here. Isn't, and maybe I, I exaggerate because it's comfortable for me. The rolling R. R. Russia. 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 So Russians, compared to Americans, Americans don't what we call roll the R. There's no R in American English. So that's something that has to be gone. So, you know, it's not Russia. It's not um, America. It's not America. It's not any R. 
and uh, so R has to change. The um, big sound is the uh, like in Russia. So Americans say Russia. That uh is very quick, whereas you originally said Russia, ra, and you spend a lot of time on the ra. And, you know, so Russians say, Russians say, come here, come. Whereas Americans, come, come here, come here. It's very quick. So Russian is more open, maybe. It's no, it's not open. It's the opposite. Uh, It's so far back, but it's just the enjoyment. Voices. I just think you people wake up and think, I can talk and I am fabulous. I am fabulous because I have great voice. I think the Russian accent is just, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sweating. (laughs) Well, you know, uh, actually, so no Russian is born with uh, the sound. They have to, no, of course not. We, yeah, well, some people think that if you were born Russian or in Russia, then you automatically have this right no we i remember myself practicing with my grandparents the whole summer vacation you know and um uh, doing yeah just practicing my accent basically yeah, i know i have students who because when i tell them i don't want this and they say to me but i spent years in school learning to roll what now you don't want this no, I can't have it, but really, it's so, and they have to unlearn what they had spent so many years, I know, I know. So the R changes, the A uh changes, Russians do also like what the Chinese do with A ah and E, eh. they do the same thing. Uh, so Russians would say, um, instead of happy, hippie, hippie, instead of ha, mm-hmm. and so I don't have a cat, I have kit, look, kit. It's a cat. So it's similar. It's really funny how we open some, uh, we have some sounds that are very open, like ah, but others are just so short and closed. I don't know. It's, it's yeah, weird. no, but it's, you know, it's Amer- American English is the same thing. Some things are very long, like long and dog. And then you've got cat. So you spend a lot of time on ah, but mm-hmm. the sound of eh, like get, is very quick. The American accent is actually quite flat. So there isn't much song to the American accent. I mean, there is, of course, but um, when I teach it, I have, depending on where the person's from, I have to flatten out their accent. So, for example, today, my Russian girl, she was actually making fun of her own accent. It was hilarious. And so she had to say some sentence. We were actually, she was recording her voicemail message and she wanted it to sound really American. So the message was, hi, I'm Maria. Um, So it's, hi, I'm Maria, leave a message and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. But she kept saying, hi, I'm Maria, leave a message and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. I said, no, no, leave message, not leave message, not leave, leave a message. So for her to flatten it out was so hard because she really wanted to sing. And then she got crazy and you're like, leave a message and I'll get back to you. So, which now sounded very Italian. But the American melody is actually, leave a message and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. So it's flat and then down at the end. So thank you so much, Claudette. I really appreciate you doing this again. And we yeah, have... Yeah, baby. And All right. Get in touch with me. Yes, and you have this amazing, beautiful dress, and on the video, oh my god, it's so beautiful. That was the interview with the gorgeous Claudette Roche. Make sure you check out her website at www.theaccentcoach.com. And if you would like to sound more American, try downloading one of her apps based on your native language. Don't worry, you will see all the links in the show notes. If you like this interview, please share it with your friends. And of course, please leave a comment below. I'm Galena and thank you for joining me today.